Hi everyone and welcome to this week's edition of HSJ's Health Check podcast. Um, this week will be hosted by me, Sharon Brennan, Senior Correspondent at HSJ. And I'm joined by Rebecca Thomas and Nicholas Cardin, also Senior Correspondents, and by Dave West, our Deputy Bureau Chief. Um, we will be discussing this week um, what the recovery from coronavirus will look like. So in that we're thinking about next steps, both in terms of testing, Con this, the potential new contract, contact tracing apps and what it means for hospitals to try and get some of the elective work back up and running that has been um, as totally collapsed during this crisis. Um, so I think what we'll start talking about and maybe open this up on the issue of um, electives and what's happening there in, um, in terms of trying to bring some of this, this work back online. Um, I listened to an interesting webinar um, this week uh, in which Barbara Haken, the ex CRO of NHS Singham, was talking about some of these issues. And um, she described, um, and as we all, as you, all the listeners will know, she described the issue of, of um, elective works as a huge problem coming to hit us on, on three angles, I think. So one was around um, uh, the fact that screening has been stood down, so we don't really know how many people out there haven't been have not been diagnosed with with something such, such as cancer and may well be diagnosed at a later stage. Um, obviously, the fact that electors are all on hold, and then also that um, we are seeing people um, not come to A and E, which I know, Dave, you've been tracking quite a lot um, yourself. Do, I mean, how how much has that um, visiting to A and E collapsed by since since this kind of um, virus started? Initially, pretty quickly after the lockdown measures were introduced, A&E attendances um, collapsed by about half, um, which is an incredible a sort of unprecedented um, reduction. I think they have then over the last couple of weeks have been creeping up uh, again a bit, not nowhere near back to normal levels, but they've been creeping up a bit, which is a, a good thing almost certainly because, um, because of the concern, as you indicate, that people uh, are having serious symptoms that they do need to go and get checked out and seemingly they weren't in before um, whether that's um, heart attacks and there's been reports of hospital admissions also producing hugely by um, by a half as well um, and uh, kind of empty stroke wards and um, cardiac wards and, and things with sort of uh, conditions that you would expect people are still going to be having despite coronavirus um, on the so I think that's there is a, a question um, there and we've we've reported on the fact that NHS England's investigating this and various um, clinical groups trying to look into it and they've been doing lots of kind of communications work trying to encourage people to come back to hospital and to other health services if they've got serious health problems that need to be checked out. Um, I mean urgently. that itself is, is, is extraordinary that you know in January and February we, we uh, trust were struggling with the vast numbers of people turning up to A&E and trying to work out how to get them to to not do so if, if their needs weren't urgent and now we're in a situation where people are actually openly saying to people come to hospital uh, on, on a you know on a regular basis you're hearing it more and more um, so you know it's a world that we never thought we'd, we'd be in but obviously there is yeah. some serious underlying concerns there that people just are too scared or or maybe too worried up putting um, pressure on the system to turn up for, for really serious serious conditions. I yeah. do wonder what this will do if we look at the waiting lists in you know, three six months time. Um, I, know, I know mental health a lot of a lot of referrals from GPs have dropped off the cliff so people aren't actually the, the initial referral isn't being made or for example uh, in one area of the West Midlands uh, teaching trust um, told the local GP practices to re-refer again in three months time now that's obviously dependent in the patient coming back and the GP doing that remembering to do that GP uh, doing that referral again so I do wonder if we've got like a f if we might see a freeze in the waiting list size um, well, because it, people yeah. aren't well, it would actually increase. Yeah, there's going to be some increase because so little is happening, but it may not be as much as you would expect because people aren't actually being referred. And then they might, uh, similar to the the accident and uh, an emergency thing, nobody knows what share of it is people who um, uh, is people who do need urgent treatment uh, and and absolutely do need to be treated and are not coming in versus people who are just not getting ill or, or hurting themselves because of life isn't much of life isn't going on um so people aren't you know, meeting other people with infections and think other infections um 
uh, versus um, or, or, you know, things that actually are self-limiting and people are a bit scared to stay away. But that's probably fine because their condition will just get better anyway. So nobody nobody knows the balance and clearly the health service will sort of should be prepared for the worst and prepared to reach out to particularly to kind of um, vulnerable groups and groups that are most likely to need urgent care, but not be seeking it or not managing to get access to it, various forms of um vulnerable groups in that category um and be ready for all that but also but it, we don't know it could be you know not quite as as terrible as um as we're expecting in terms of the ex extra demand over the next um over the coming period but i think even though i was going to say um sharon when you asked about the elective thing even though there may not be uh, uh we don't know how big the kind of um the kind of delayed surge in demand will be uh, of non-coronavirus, uh, you know, health problems. We do know that the NHS will need to find and maintain substantial extra capacity because of the issue that it will need to be ready, kind of on constant alert for another surge in coronavirus demand. So whatever normal business it can, when coronavirus started um, arriving in earnest, it was decided that the NHS needed to sort of free up 30,000 beds, buy out all the private sector capacity and start um, uh, increasing critical care capacity enormously. Uh, and that's what it's done. And there's now, you know, um, four times more beds empty than usual in hospitals. Um, but it could easily be argued that that will need to continue, or at least nearly all of that will need to be kept free in case there's another rapid surge in coronavirus demand. Um, so uh, and the NHS will need to be running other services um, whether it's stuff like major rehab efforts for people who've had coronavirus or double running um, hot coronavirus only hospitals and GP practices and versus cold coronavirus free services and pathways and hospitals and, and things. So it will somehow have to find a way to create lots of extra capacity, even if there isn't actually lots of extra demand in, in, the, uh, in, in the near future. I think one just to say as well, one really important bit of that is going to be um, like the use of modelling and and, and, and I can't say it, analytics um, because obviously now we've had the first sort of peak of of COVID nineteen, so that's provided a a pattern that sort of people might might look at. But now I know there's a lot of work going on. For example, Energy Digital, they're trying to work out um, if if there are going to be future waves of, of COVID nineteen. Um, you know how those waves might look, and if they can kind of get the modelling right early on on that, based on what we've had so far, then that will enable the NHS to far better plan for those those uh, those surges and make sure that it maintains the like the, the correct balance between mm. um, between sort of what capacity is needed to be held back in case of surges and what other things to, to crack on with as well. So that's that's quite an interesting space to look out for, I think, in the next few weeks. Yeah, who's going to be the I... brave um, health secretary who says, oh, actually, no, you don't need to keep 30,000 beds free. Just go with 5,000 and do everything else. And then we'll just kind of, uh, you know, trust the modelers and, and uh, I, anticipate I also think... there's not going to be a big surge. Um... When you're talking to lots, uh, I've been talking to quite a few doctors and consultants over this period of time and, you know, um, absolutely amazed at the speed at which they're learning about this virus um, and the changes they're making to to care as a result. Um, I think we have seen um, in the last few weeks kind of a shift in, in how to care for COVID-19 from kind of a view that everyone needs to be ventilated to now an idea that actually that may not be the best option for quite a lot of people. And, and once on a vent, it's very hard to get people off them. Um, and I think that does speak quite a lot about what what the future capacity will look like. And um, so, for example, a lot of these nightingales were set up very much to, to help with the respiratory side of things. And it seems that the way to treat them now, um, people now with coronavirus, is shifting quite a lot from kind of um, ventilation to much more high flow oxygen and, and trying to, you know, keep people prone much earlier on. Um, and I think some of that will have to feed into the modelling that you talked about, Nick, because if you see, obviously, if you treat these patients in a different way, then the capacity and, and the actual kit that you need um, will be very different. Um, we actually just went out on a story today about worries around dialysis in um, kid, uh, in, in ICUs because they're finding um, that up to 30% of patients who are ventilated also need dialysis support and um, that's a much much higher percentage of people that are having multi-organ failure than was expected and they are as a result globally but especially in the UK running out of supplies and the standard dialysis machines are, are, are kind of we're running out of them for the people that need sure. them. Um, Yes, Rebecca. Oh, do you know how that's affecting people who need regular dialysis access? Do you know how it's well, affecting I think that's, a, that's an interesting question and it does feed into this idea of what next and, and how do you get back to a normal service. Um, 
well, normally you have um having become an expert on dialysis in in, in a day um <laughs> uh i found out there's many different dialysis machines and many different um ways of treating people and the machine that you use in ICU is normally very different to the machine you use for people who have chronic kidney disease and need to be treated on a long-term basis and bearing in mind a lot of those chronic kidney diseases are going to carry on and need dialysis for quite a while because you know we reported a couple of weeks ago that all transplants have been stood down um well most unless it's a severely urgent like um life or death situation um so normally you're treated um on a intermittent machine if you've got chronic condition which means you go in three times a week and some of those machines are now being taken and plugged into the ICU we've been very 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 clearly assured that people's dialysis is not going to stop there is not going to be an issue where they're choosing between chronic and um, acute patients that's not going to happen but we are hearing that where patients can manage it so where they have some kidney function left they are having their sessions cut from three to two already um, that was partly to deal with staff sicknesses and the problems people had about accessing that dialysis um, and whether that would then continue because some of that staff that's using the chronic um, environment would have to be moved into the acute environment to manage these machines, um, we might we may start seeing. So I think, Dave, that goes right back to what we were talking about at the start, about how do you start thinking about, you know, getting normal services back um, and getting electives back in, in in process and kind of some of this, these normal treatment back on up back back up to scale and, and given the care expected yeah. alongside managing an ongoing coronavirus um problem yeah. so i mean and the kit they, and the staff who've been diverted like you said some of the the, the equipment has been moved to coronavirus so are they gonna uh, uh, for electives uh, most um anesthetists and um there and the equipment they normally use the ventilators that are in theaters um for uh, on hand for elective surgery are all being used in the kind of expanded critical care for um for coronavirus now as well so they have to kind of there's, there's i think there's a lot of tr tr chief execs who actually um in some cases are having kind of more time on their hands because hospitals are apart from um coronavirus are very very quiet chief execs are sort of giving time to thinking about um how they restart some of this and what the next you know few weeks looks like and what the next six months and beyond looks like um but I do think they probably need a signal. There's going to have to be a signal from NHS England and or Department of Health nationally to to say yes, d this is our uh, policy. It's on the national policy and framing of that to give people the confidence to free up the use of um, of of the the critical care uh, COVID capacity that's there at the moment. To say we want you to shift it back to other things because it is a it is a risk and a big thing to do. Can I ask it, how how likely is it you think that we'll we'll see um you know hot and cold splits but not A and E and not not emergency and electives but you know normal hospital services and COVID if we have that split is that likely yeah. to happen do you think yeah so, or... there are uh, I mean between completely different sites I mean they'll have to split it you know I think as Sharon said within uh, within a hospital as already they've already they've been been uh, seeking to uh, do those splits within sites. Um, and we and they will you know hopefully they'll want to be expanding the um uh expanding the the kind of the green uh, uh clean covid free areas of hospitals but then um and of course we do have dedicated covid hospitals at the moment in the shape of um the nightingales um which are you know, not good, not doing anything else at the moment uh, other than covid it will not do much covid at all either um the the um uh, but the more controversial thing would be to designate particular acute hospitals as completely coronavirus free, um, red, uh, green or completely um, dedicated to coronavirus red, um, sort of in the way that you, you have configurations of sort of hot, hot hospitals for um, emergency care and, and cold for elective, as you say. And um, at the moment, there's not been a lot of that, although a number of, you know, plenty of trusts do have um, one acute site and one small sort of hospital that might have used to provide emergency care but now it's just an urgent care center and does electives and mm. outpatients and diagnostics so there are sort of there are kind of little mini versions of that going on but whether a region you know it's probably more likely in the big urban areas isn't it so london or um or birmingham actually where um uh you know already uhb is sort of playing a big role in coordinating critical care it's it's more likely in the urban and, and in london we've as we've reported i think it's um uh, the Bart's Hospital and um, Brompton, is it, or something that um, uh, that's um, 
doing um, sort of urgent elective and is therefore being kept more clean of coronavirus, albeit not not entirely clean. And of course, you can't keep it entirely clean because you don't know who's got coronavirus. Um, but yeah, you could have a controversial situation where a hospital, where, where a region or a, a sort of a planners are seeking to nominate a hospital to be the, the coronavirus hospital for this county <laughs> or this SDP or this region. And um, people would, would not want that to be the case. <laughs> or I mean, a bit similar people people normally want to keep emergency services at the local hospital so if an acute hospital was being nominated to be dedicated to um elective plan care only that would could be controversial as well i mean one of the big things that's flagging in my mind when we talk about this and, and nick i think maybe you, you can speak a bit on this is is you know if you really want a covid free service you need to make sure that every patient and every nurse and every doctor and every member of staff from cleaners right up through to porters and, and the catering companies are coronavirus free and i think to do that you need to know that they are they can be tested and nick i know that you, this is an issue you've been looking into but where does the controversial issue around testing stand at the moment yeah it's very controversial and it, i think it's something which is potentially going to you know be a real problem for Matt Hancock. This might be the sort of the, the thing that he'll be remembered a little bit for. I think if it, if it goes the way it looks like it will, because he's very clearly set this hundred thousand tests to be carried out every day by the end of April, and at the moment, you know, testing numbers are roughly about twenty two thousand or so, and there's what about eight nine eight days to go i think so um you know he's, he's been really clear on that hundred thousand figure and it's it's one of those numbers that people are just going to remember and if he doesn't hit it i think it's going to be problematic so um uh i think where he's because of gone wrong it's probably been to um a not have enough uh, people eligible for testing which is a really weird thing to say because you, you think in a pandemic you know as you just test as many as you can if you've got the capacity to test then you do it but they have, don't seem to have really sorted out the best way for uh, how to get the capacity um, filled because currently they can they can test about 40,000 people a day but they're not doing that so you know they announced a couple of days ago more I think it was policemen, fire fire officers, um, social care workers, but even that is not going to take the the testing numbers daily up to to the required levels. So do we have a sense of why that is? Why they? I think I think the problem is uh, so in terms of the fire and police services and social care, um, it might have just come a little bit too late because you still have to organise you know the bulk of people. To, well, the staff to, to go and get tested and make sure that they can do that um, and obviously these regional testing centres that have been set up the sort of the drive-throughs as they're sort of known as um, again some of them are placed in not very easy to access areas if you haven't got cars um, so there hasn't really been a up to now much thought about how to get tests to people it's been more focused on how to get people to test, which, you know, it just isn't possible in, in, in many in many examples. So um, I know, you know, a few days ago there was reports that they're now trying to use, I think it was Amazon um, to get tests delivered to people's homes or, you know, people's sort of rural offices uh, into the care homes. But that is something which, you know, I'm sure it will boost the numbers, but you do wonder why it, that wasn't considered earlier because they have known that they are going to have to set up these kind of commercial testing centres. Um, but sort of it's inevitable that some people just aren't going to be able to, to access those tests either. So that process seems to have started very late, which is contributing to the problem that, that I've been talking about. Well, I wonder um, if um, logistics plays an issue in it as well. Um, I, I, was, I was speaking to a social care provider based in Southampton whose staff had been told their nearest test centre was Gatwick. Whereas the mental health trust down the road was offering to do to carry out the tests, but through the official system, for example, through CQC, who are allocating it, I've told them the nearest centre is Gatwick. Mm. Um, yeah, um, we have. I think these... we've also. Okay. Um, feeding into that, Rebecca, I think we're we're feeding a, a, a lot more frustration from staff. Um, around these issues such as testing and PPE because there's been continuous promises that are just not happening and I think around that staff area you know it does sound like people aren't, aren't thinking what it is to be a care worker on you know eight pound an hour maybe they don't have the car nor probably the petrol money to be driving all over the place to get these tests done I mean um, it, it doesn't seem to be think that people are really plugged into what people are doing on the ground and, and what it means to be kind of maybe a, a lower paid 
but essential um, worker or, you know, nurses doing back to back shifts, incredibly stressed. And then, you know, maybe um, not getting the PPE they need, which I know, again, Nick, you said that Matt Hancock may be haunted by this hundred thousand pound test, hundred thousand testing capacity. <laughs> but I think the PPE thing is, is we've seen this week the frustration from NHS Confed and, and what they've come out with is, you know, I think people are just kind of fed up and had enough that these promises are coming and, and just are not being matched. Um, and I think uh, one of the issues, Dave, when you were talking about these COVID free and COVID um, hot areas, without the PPE, I mean, you can't ask some staff to go and put their, their life on the line in one hospital and then the others get, you know, a much easier, a much a less fearful work, work environment in a COVID free hospital. And I think well, really if you want to make that work, you do need to ensure that everyone has genuine safeguards put in place well of course you need to but you could have yeah we'd say the same for the last few weeks couldn't you they have there are hot and cold areas and there are people who are well many uh tens of thousands of people who are taking those risks um so uh, it, it, of course it becomes um really difficult when there's not the ppe to um to the, the, to use the PP that's recommended, and then it's just kind of for Kelly the extremely horrendous decisions for their the managers of those people and those people themselves. And uh, I mean, talking, I think absolutely the PP thing is pertinent to the re sort of um, uh, the kind of the recovery or the sort of restoration or the reconstruction effort over the next few weeks because you can't start doing loads of elective um you can't massively ramp up the activity of the nhs if the ppe isn't available to do it because clearly ppe would be needed in a lot of those um kind of if you're doing surgery and stuff on people who may well have um who uh, may well be infected um so that that is a constraint um but also um just as a sort of side thing on that that ppe situation it still is uh, yeah right at the top of the the issues troubling um hospital and healthcare service bosses i think um and that issue where you talk about whether you know should staff work if they don't have the correct um, ppe or the correct ppe they think they should have there's a it's an area um a bit like this sort of ethical kind of ceilings of care thing where the center could arguably should arguably the regulators or the department of health or nhs england should arguably be arguably be saying well this is our recommendation to employers um in terms of how about what what you do to, with staff when if they don't want to work um in those circumstances because otherwise you're leaving a lot of liability and stress and um and you know legal and um blame liability on on local managers for making those horrible decisions about treating people versus protecting your staff i think there's also but, a question about some of the softer side of things when it comes to um uh looking at the resilience and, and the mental health of, of some of this staff because you can you know i think there's been a phenomenal amount of of, of effort put in by everyone in the health and social care sector to look after people and I think there's a recognition that you do that in a crisis but if this is something with you know coronavirus we have to live with for another year or two we see second peaks I mean a lot of that goodwill will go if the government's not sitting there also you know uh, doing their side of things of ensuring that the PPE and, and the testing is needed when it's been called for for so long and also you've got to ask how resilient can a staff member be continuously going in fearful for their life that can't you know someone can't continue to work at that adrenaline le level day in day out with Without, you know being at, at one point having to say you know I've done my bit and I can't carry on in, in this scenario where you know every day I'm fearful for not only myself getting sick but you know maybe go back to families or having to be isolated from families so I do think when we look what next what, what's next I think we do have to start getting some control over some of these areas and Nick I just want to go to you because there's a new a new idea being floated although it's been around for about a month but this idea of contract tracing which I know mm. the who was saying we should have done in the middle of March but now it's coming back to the fore again <laughs> it is yeah it's that's gonna be a really interesting one to follow I think over the next month or so um and it's been notable because there hasn't really been much sort of information said about it so NHSX the, the organization which is sort of developing that app they're they're keeping pretty quiet about the details um of how it's going to work and that's probably because they haven't quite worked out themselves yet but there's been very little kind of publicly av available information um broadly the way they want the app to work is that if I'm you know walking in the park and 
I'm, I'm registered on the app and my phone uh if i come into proximity with someone else uh also in that park who who has either had a, a positive covid test um previously or has inputted themselves uh that they have some symptoms that could be related to covid i would then get an alert on my phone uh telling me that i might need to to go back home and isolate or um get get myself a test as soon as i can um so that's kind of broadly how the app would work um but there are all sorts of difficulties when you're trying to roll out that kind of software because it's very difficult to design a system that isn't open to being abused you know whether it's people who, who are registering with the app and kind of putting in symptoms just for fun and without having them just to kind of scare people so you know the, the equivalent of online trolls effectively um you've also got to protect uh, people who are inputting their health data, that that data is not going to be used by uh, the, the, the the software companies that are providing the, the actual tool itself. So there's all sorts of sort of considerations, uh, practical and ethical to overcome. Um, so that's why I think it'd be very interesting to see which direction this app goes in. Um, it's apparently being piloted as we speak uh, in a sort of uh, yet to be defined area of the north of England apparently um, so we sort of await uh, the outcome of that but um, yeah I think it's going to be again a very very uh, important bit of the the next step strategy but as of yet we don't know too much about it. I think it's quite clear from all of us here that um, we are um, the, of how you, how you kind of move the health service on from, from this kind of coronavirus focus is still really unclear and I think Dave you kind of got it there with the idea that people need a signal from NHS England and or DHSC on kind of next steps and you know maybe we need to wait for Boris to come back uh, our Prime Minister Boris Johnson to come back and maybe give a bit more steer to what's going on so we're no longer reliant on kind of people deputising for him obviously when that happens we don't know um, but you know I think we're, we're, we're out of time um, it's been a really interesting conversation so thank you Nick Rebecca and Dave um, for contributing. Um, I would like to very quickly to all listeners say that I to apologise to Dave on record that I did give him the wrong job title and I have demoted him. He is, he is not a deputy <laughs> bureau chief, he is our deputy editor and I'm saying that <laughs> because I still like to keep my job. I'd um, like listeners to know I didn't passively aggressively uh, text Sharon uh, behind the scenes. <laughs> yeah that was a voluntary <laughs> apology on, on my part. Anyway th I hope you all enjoyed it and um, please uh, uh, share, share this podcast around you and, and um, make sure that you um, listen for the next week's as well.